we'll be covering today. So uh, it's three parts, uh, very easy. The first part is um, why should you care about chatbots, what are chatbots? And in this part, I'll talk a little bit about uh, chatbots, a little bit about AI, a little bit about uh, ML. And then after that, we're going to talk about some very basic uh, chatbot concepts, like what's a chatbot? And what are like the four main components of a chatbot? And what makes a chatbot unique? Um, for example, one of the things that makes a chatbot really unique is that they're pretty easy to build. So we'll be covering the making of a bot in section uh, three, in part three. And we'll find out that the main challenges of building a good bot, um, we'll find out what's the easy parts of building a bot, and so on. So first, a little bit about myself. My name is Stefan Kujahara. I'm the founder of Chatbots Life. We help companies build bots, and we share insights along the way. Uh, we've helped uh, a lot of the top um, bot companies with their bots. Uh, for example, Swelly. They have over 2 million users, and they're kind of a hot or not bot on Facebook Messenger. We help them uh, on the product design part. And right now, uh, the product design is one of the most challenging parts of making a good bot. And, and the primary reason is because it's a completely new paradigm. So it's a new paradigm shift. So we have to think about bots and making bots in a completely new and different way. Uh, other companies that we've worked with are, are Near Group, uh, which is a dating bot. It's uh, becoming very, very popular. Um, I think in their busiest day, they had 1.3 million messages. Uh, we've also worked with Outbrain, um, which is a news aggregator, but they use um, AI and uh, machine learning to, to know what kind of news stories you'll like based on previous behavior, which we'll get into later. Uh, this is one of the superpowers of bots. So uh, a little bit about my background. My, my education is in business and psychology. Uh, graduated in 2009. and. Um, Great time to graduate. <laughs> Started my first business uh, with a very small amount of money, um, and I did a lot of A-B testing. Started with $300, and within a year and a half, I grew it to, to over a million. And then in 2013, I exited that business. Uh, it was a small business, so I knew the, the problems that a lot of small business owners had. And I got into technology. I got into, I founded an app that allowed you to uh, text message businesses. So. Let's say that you wanted to text message uh, your hairdresser or a plumber or a restaurant, you would be able to do it through our app. And, and we had this feature where if you wanted to, uh, let's say, get a haircut in an hour, it could broadcast your, your message. Um, and it would go to all those different hairdressers in your area. Um, we could filter it down to hairdressers that would have, you know, let's say, a four-star rating on Yelp. And uh, you could send them a message like, hey, I got... $75 or I got $50, I want a men's haircut, I want it within the hour, can you do it? And, and naturally, uh, businesses would respond. One of the interesting things that we found out is that a lot of these businesses didn't want to respond. <laughs> they wanted an automatic option. So in 2015, um, I moved to the, to the Bay Area, right now I'm based out of uh, San Francisco, and we saw these, this bot thing coming. We knew that Facebook was going to, to go into bots, and it was, it was a very natural um, transition um, pivot uh, for us to go into bots. And um, this addressed the question of, of, of businesses not wanting to answer those questions. And um, founded Chatbots Life. Uh, right now, we're also the, the number one place to learn about bots. We have a lot of tutorials. And I think we're number two in traffic overall for all bot publications. So without further ado, let's get started. So, Part one, why should you care? And this is one of the main uh, questions that get asked over and over again. It's like, why bots? Why is this even a thing? Why is this happening now? And there's two main reasons. And these reasons are really, really big. Uh, the first one is that messaging apps are absolutely killing it. So right now, uh, messaging apps are going faster than social media sites. They're actually growing faster than social media sites that are in their heyday. So what this means is two things. So the first thing it means is that there's going to be a lot of consumers that are on these messaging apps that want to talk to businesses. And so naturally, businesses are going to want to be there. Uh, the other thing you, you're going to have that, that's happening is that some of these messaging apps like Facebook Messenger and uh, Facebook and Facebook Pages, there's a lot of overlap. So well, since probably the early 2000s, uh, when social media apps became really popular, you had a lot of people that were asking questions to businesses for customer service purposes 
on Twitter, on Facebook. And, and these businesses were answering those questions. Now some of those conversations are going to start happening in Messenger. So what you have is you have demand from uh, consumers that want to be able to talk to businesses through messaging. And then you have businesses that want to be on these platforms because the consumers are there. And, um, and on top of this, the, the growth cycle for phase one for the messaging companies was uh, growth. That was their phase one goal, and, and they've accomplished it. So for their phase two goal, they're going to want to build out their platforms, and they're going to want to give access to developers and to businesses so, and then, so they can later monetize these platforms. So we're already seeing this. Um, one of the first companies to do bots was WeChat out of China, and they, they were doing this, you know, a long time ago. They were doing this in, like, when we were having apps come out, they were doing bots instead. So uh, it's a proven concept. Um, it's very, very popular in China. So this is the first big reason why, why bots are coming up. Now, let me show you the second one. And, and the second one is consumption. So if you look at the way we consume apps, and you compare it to websites or songs or pretty much anything else, uh, you'll see that apps don't get consumed that much. The average person uh, consumes, uses about 27 different apps throughout the year. Um, they go to over 1,000 websites, and they have over 7,000 songs on their iTunes library. Um, also, the average person watches about uh, four hours of TV a day. So what this means is that, uh, is that apps don't have a long tail effect. Uh, it also means that Businesses don't get a benefit from making apps. There's no money in it. And developers uh, don't get a benefit from making apps. There's no money in it. Uh, in fact, your, your grandmother is more likely to make a widget uh, or like a trinket and sell it on Amazon and make money from a trinket than an app de developers to, to make an app and make, monetize it. So one of the questions is, why is this? Why, why is it that apps is, have failed us? compared to websites, songs, books, and, and other things that we consume. And, and how can bots avoid this, right? So apps have failed us for two main reasons. So first we'll start with unknown unknowns. Uh, simply put, there's over 2 million uh, apps on the App Store, and the apps are so many that there's no way you're going to keep be able to keep track of all the different things that apps can do. So what that means is that if there's an app that could really help you in a, in a time of need, you won't know that that app exists, and you won't be able to uh, use use that technology. Uh, for example, if you get stranded in the middle of nowhere, you probably don't know that there's uh, an app that delivers gas on demand. You just download the app, um, and the gas will come to you. Um, so this is a really big problem. Uh, the next really big problem is that the human attention span is very, very limited. So at any one time, we can only hold up to four items simultaneously in our short-term memory. So ultimately what that means is that brands and uh, companies that have a daily use case have a huge advantage. Since we interact with them on a daily basis, it's much easier for us to remember. And if you're not one of these companies, uh, you're going to have to spend a gazillion dollars to be remembered. Um, Geico is a really good example of that. They spend a gazillion dollars because if they didn't, we would never remember Geico. Um, the thing about apps is it's impractical for two million apps to spend a gazillion dollars to be remembered. Uh, it's it's something that will will never happen. So the next question is is can bots solve this problem? And if so, how can they? Can they solve the problem of our inability to remember? And can they solve the problem of unknown unknowns? So before we answer the question, let's first think about what the bot future looks like. So one of the really cool things that's coming up, and we're already seeing this happening, is that pretty soon. We're going to be living in a fully integrated world, technologically. So the first thing that's going to happen, and we're already seeing this start, is that we're going to have a single entry point to all of our, technolo to, to all of our technology. So right now, chances are, you probably have uh, more than one calendar app, you probably have more than one email address, you probably have more than one to-do list. Uh, you probably have, you might be using more than one product management app like Trello or Basecamp. And you probably have more than one computer, so that means your documents are all over the place. They're in the cloud, they're probably in Google Drive, they might be in Dropbox, they might be spread across two different computers, some might be in um, Microsoft, so, and so on. So when it, when it comes to getting things done, that's a huge inefficiency. So one of the first things we'll see 
is a virtual assistant type of bot that ties in all of your the technology that you're using and gives you a single entry point. So in the future, when you want to know what your, what your schedule looks like, it'll be able to access all your calendars. If you want to find that one email, it'll look at all the email addresses you have. If you're looking for a document, it'll easily be able to find it for you. The other cool thing that we're, we're going to see is AI and automation. Um, basically, a lot of the really simple tasks will take care of themselves uh, automatically. And we're already seeing this. Uh, an example would be, let's say that in, in the very near future, it might be months, it might be, might be a little bit longer, um, let's say you and I wanted to set up an appointment. And we say, hey, we say, Stefan, let's talk next week. And I'm like, okay, let's set up the appointment. Right now, we would have to go back and forth about when we should meet. Uh, in the near future, my bot will talk to your bot, and it will automatically find the best time for us to meet, and the schedule, the appointment will be scheduled automatically uh, without us interacting. So the other cool thing is the IoT and the Internet of Things. Um, simply put, everything will talk. So what does that mean? That means that your refrigerator in the future will be able to order eggs for you when, when you run low. The sprinkler system will turn itself on uh, if it doesn't rain. Um, if your house brings a leak, um, it'll call a plumber for you automatically so you don't come home to a disaster. And the last part, and I think this is really cool, is that we're going to have a scalable super personalization. So if you look at what Google's already doing, is, uh, <laughs> and I hope you already know this, <laughs> um, they're listening to us in the background. Uh, they're also looking at the behavior that we're we're conducting. For example, uh, if we go if we leave every morning at 9 a.m. at 9:30, we're at you know 123 Main Street. Uh, it can anticipate that uh, that's probably our work address. And and then the next day after it sees this pattern enough times, it'll it'll give us the best driving directions. It'll tell us what the weather is. So uh, pretty soon, bots will have this sort of ability. They'll have the ability to track and predict uh, your your patterns. Uh, that also means they'll be able to predict your mental patterns, your moods, your performance, and they, they might even anticipate needs and provide solutions even before you request it. You might not even be aware of it. Uh, an example of this might be that uh, maybe every Monday morning you're tired. Um, and the bot notices this because you talk to the bot and you say, hey, I'm tired. And maybe the bot does an A-B test on you, which it says, hey, uh, Stefan, or why don't you try drinking green tea this morning? you know, instead of having coffee, right? And, and, and then it notices that whenever you drink green tea on Monday mornings, your performance goes up by a little bit. So we're going to see uh, these sort of things uh, coming about. So one of the, one of the cool things to, to think about is how is this all going to work together? How would a virtual assistant be able to access all the different types of technology uh, so it's useful? And, and this is a really good question. So um, one of the biggest problems with, with uh, the idea of a virtual assistant is the idea that a virtual assistant can't possibly do everything. Uh, there's way too many verticals and it, it's impossible to, to ensure quality. So what a lot of these companies have done is they've done something really, really smart and they've offloaded that task partially to developers. So in the future, uh, let's say that you wanted to order pizza. You, you might ask Siri, you'll say, hey Siri, I want to order pizza. And, and what Siri will do is it'll go through, uh, it'll ask you a bunch of questions, you know, do you want pepperoni, do you want breadsticks, uh, do you want Coca-Cola, um, and you'll give it the answers. It'll, it'll very quickly learn what your favorite pizza place is, what your credit card number is, uh, that you like pepperoni pizza. Now, how is it going to handle that request? How is it going to get pizza to your door? Well, in some cases, it's going to summon a pizza bot. So through the back end, uh, it'll, it'll place that order for you using a pizza bot, and that pizza bot will have all the integration points with all the restaurants and delivery services and payments and, and everything. So uh, on one level, you're going to have these front-end virtual assistants like uh, Siri, Facebook M, uh, Google Home, uh, Echo, Alexa, and so on. Um, and then these uh, master bots, they're going to be summoning slave bots that will do things on their behalf. Uh, the other type of handoff, uh, I think you're going to see two different types of handoffs. One of them is going to be indirect where you don't even know that there's a pizza bot working in the background and then the other one might be a very direct handoff. Um, an example might be let's say that you have a um, a parking ticket and, and, and you tell your friend that hey I just got this parking ticket. Now you're texting this on Facebook and 
your friend sees this text. And maybe Facebook Cam in the future will introduce you to the do not pay bot and say, hey, Stefan, I saw you got a parking ticket. Uh, here's, a, here's the do not pay bot. He could help you process, uh, fight your parking ticket. And, and that's just a, a straight handoff. Um, another area where I think we'll see a lot of um, bots is in the B2B space, where they automatically handle a lot of bad kind of requests for companies. Um, I think there's going to be a really large portion of bots that you never, ever see, that you don't even know exist. So next is, um, what will the, the bot user experience be like? What, what, are, what is it that going to look like? So if you think about um, what we're living in right now in, uh, on the web, web, websites are a lot more like magazines than apps, right? They're static content. Uh, bots will transform this and they'll make them dynamic and interactive. So what that means is in the future, uh, websites are going to be a lot more like bots. When you go to a website, they're going to know a lot of your preferences so they can serve you the content that they think you'll like the most. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, imagine if you went to the Polo Ralph Lauren store. Right now, um, the homepage of the Polo Ralph Lauren store, it tries to meet everyone's needs. Right? Whether you're a, a boy or a girl or a man or a woman, whether you're looking for uh, polos or dresses or um, it, maybe you're looking for whole home decor, it gives you all that on one page. In the future, uh, going to a website or using a bot, it'll be the equivalency of walking into the mall and automatically being in your favorite store, automatically being in your favorite part of the store, you know, section, and uh, and looking at that shirt that you've been thinking about buying. Um, another cool thing is that as this thing evolves, uh, websites and bots will, will become more and more like instant apps that you can talk to. So one of the questions I get is like. How close are we to all this? And, and what's coming next? So McKinsey did this really interesting uh, study. A lot of these companies are doing these sort of studies right now. And they typically focus on um, what percentage of jobs are automatable. And, and the number, uh, there's a lot of different numbers. But one of them is like 47% uh, of jobs within 20 years. Uh, now McKinsey took a different approach. They asked, given current technology that we can use right now, how many uh, tasks can we automate? How many activities can we automate right now? And what they found out is that 45% of work activities could be automated using technology we have. And when they looked at the different uh, verticals and different positions with those verticals, a lot of them were white collar jobs, a lot of them were blue collar jobs. And here's an example of, of a marketer's job. So a marketing manager that makes $120,000 a year, um, we could automate about 13, 14% of their work. Okay, this 45% um, of automatable tasks, this represents a savings of a day and a half out of the typical work week for the average company, a day and a half. It also represents a, a $2 trillion savings uh, for, for, for companies uh, worldwide. So uh, this is pretty huge. So where are the biggest opportunities? Now this is a really, really important question to ask because um, you know, you're working for a company, so <laughs> companies have to start looking at this. Um, and the other people that are looking at this is uh, tech entrepreneurs. And, and I'm getting a lot of these, this information from, from colleagues of mine. They give it to me. So this is what we're all looking at here in the Valley. And uh, this is from the same study. And this is uh, machine learning has the greatest impact to, and where is it? So you'll see right off the bat that strategic optimization is pretty much high impact across the board. Uh, predictive analytics, high impact across the board forecasting high impact almost across the board. And then you see other things that are uh, pretty uh, high, like a real-time optimization. Now, we also can look at uh, each vertical. So here's automotive and manufacturing. And again, let's see if we see a pattern. Uh, we see predictive maintenance, operations, logistics, forecasting, predictive analytics. Uh, that's for manufacturing. Then for automotive, process, predictive maintenance, operations, operations, uh, forecasting is the highest impact. So for consumer products, um, again, it's price and product optimization. Uh, right now, if you go to two different stores in two different parts of town, you're probably going to see two different prices. Um, I remember one time I was uh, looking to buy something from Home Depot, and their online price for me was different than the online price for the store manager. Uh, which was kind of really odd because it, it's, it's one company, it's in one location, but 
the, the price they showed me on my phone was different than the price they showed her on her phone. And the, and the price difference was like 20% uh, on a $500 item. So it, it, was, it was a pretty big, pretty sizable difference. So, so we're going to see price and product optimization so you don't see these uh, differences. And, and, I, and I'm pretty sure you'll see a bot pretty soon that will make sure you're getting the lowest price at all times. Um, radical personalization. This is going to be really, really huge. Uh, operations and logistics, forecasting again, predictive analytics, for, and then for finance, uh, radical personalization, discovery, predictive analytics, predictive maintenance. So we're kind of seeing the pattern. Here's agriculture, um, radical personalization, price and product optimization, forecasting, forecasting, and again, uh, and then for energy, it's predictive analytics and maintenance operations. As you can see, a lot of these sort of jobs are and activities, these tasks, they're a lot of them are really white collar tasks. They're not. They're not uh, just blue collar jobs. Um, again, here we go. Healthcare, predictive, uh, radical personalization, resource allocation, forecasting. So we get to see kind of this pattern, right? Um, pharmaceuticals, price, predictive analytics, again and again. Uh, and then here's social sector, and then media. So, and this is for telecom, on the left. And again, you guys have access to this, so you can look at it more deeply. Uh, but we get to see this pattern, right? So developers that were making bots were asked what, what kind of bots they're making. Are they making them for businesses, consumers, or both? You kind of see the, the split. It's pretty pretty even. And then they were also asked, uh, what are they building right now? <laughs> so again, we'll see this kind of pattern emerge. Retail and e-commerce, because it's personalizable and it's a really big opportunity. Productivity, okay, customer service. Uh, we get to see some overlap with, with the previous uh, previous data. So what are the biggest opportunities for your company? So um, I would take at least like a few minutes to think about this and it's really really important because if you're not thinking about it someone else is and um, if your company doesn't disrupt themselves someone else will. Um, this technology is we almost don't have a choice but but to use it. So <laughs> um, I would say think about three or four different use cases where you think that this sort of technology could really help your company and then also think of two or three cases where it could help your life. Um, and brainstorm some of these, and, and at the end of this talk, we could talk about them if you like. So uh, next we're gonna go to part two, which is uh, chatbot basics. Um, and so the first part is like, what is a chatbot? So uh, there's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. So a chatbot is, is a, has four main components. So it has an application and a server, and these things are very, you guys know what they are, but I'll just briefly summarize. An application is the part that does something. So let's say you have a weather app, it's the part that tells you what time to, you know, what the weather is. Uh, then you have a server database. You have an NLP layer that processes all the language. Uh, basically translate uh, language into inputs and outputs. And then you have the front end. Uh, the front end is where the bot lives. And this is usually on, usually on a messaging platform. So, Let's look at some of the messaging platforms. So this is uh, these are some of the top ones right now. And I'll go over some of them briefly, just because uh, they have, each have advantages and disadvantages. And I think it's important to note them. So the biggest player um, in the United States is uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, Messenger has over a billion users. Um, most of the users are in the United States and Western Europe. And if you're building a bot that's consumer facing, I would totally build it on Messenger first. Uh, there's so many advantages that it, I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, for example, uh, they're always evolving their, their, their product. Um, they're always they're looking for product market fit and, and more than any other company, Facebook knows how to make a great, amazing product. So, so that's one reason why I would, one of the main reasons why I would go with Facebook Messenger. Um, the other really big one is, is the logo underneath it, it's WeChat. Um, it's like the two green uh, speech bubbles. So WeChat has um, over 800 million users. They're mostly in China. They were one of the first uh, um, messaging platforms to have bots. Um, they're great for the Chinese market. Uh, WeChat you should look at strongly uh, so you can learn from it. WeChat had bots uh, back in like, I think like 2009, 10, something like that. It was really, really early. Um, and the reason is, is because um, apps never took off in the Chinese market. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why that happened. One is that uh, when apps first started coming out, 
Uh, the Chinese didn't have phones that were strong and powerful enough to process them. Um, and then their internet connections weren't strong enough. So instead what happened was uh, WeChat became the app that everybody used. And WeChat uh, is a messaging app. Uh, and it allowed businesses and people, developers, to build bots. So you, you kind of have really gooey rich uh, bots on WeChat. And you can do all kinds of things on WeChat. Like, um, for example, um, let's say that you wanted to go to dinner. You can pull out your WeChat, find the restaurant you want to go to, look at their menu, order, pay for it. When you walk into that restaurant, you scan like a QR code. The food automatically comes to you. You eat it and you leave. There is no cashier. There is no line. There is, uh, yeah, th there is no waitress or waiter. Everything is just automatic. Um, and a lot of restaurants have this sort of capability in, in China. And funny enough, we don't have it here. Uh, Skype has also jumped on, on the bandwagon. It could build a bots for Skype. The cool thing about Skype, Skype is that uh, their bots are, uh, you can use avatars. So you could be talking to you know a cartoon-like figure uh, that could have facial gestures and this sort of thing. Slack is really big for B2B. So a lot of companies are using Slack for uh, internal communication. And there's a lot of bots on Slack that automate a lot of things. So for example, um, let's say that you, know, you wanted to um, take pictures of all your receipts um, when you go to lunch with, for business meetings. Uh, a Slack bot could could look at the data and, and figure out how you know could add them all up for you, right? Um, and and there's so many good, really good bots on Slack. I, I really recommend checking it out. They have over 200 million users. Uh, it's mostly for messaging coworkers. And if you're looking to build something that's B2B, uh, I would recommend going there. Uh, Kick is uh, mostly for teens. There are about 200 million users, I believe, and uh, they're they're. Uh, target audience is mostly in the United States. So if you're looking to build a product of bot facing for teens, uh, Kick is a great place to start. The other cool thing about Kick is they have a store. They don't have a lot of competition, which means that it's a lot easier to get users to try your bot on Kick than uh, most of the other platforms. Telegram is, um, they're based out of Russia, but now the team kind of travels around the world <laughs> as they work on their product. And they have a little over 200 million users, I think like 220 or something like that, the last the numbers I heard. They're really popular in Russia, a lot of these European uh, countries, and, and they're also in South America, um, Brazil, Argentina, I believe. So if you're looking to do something for South America, uh, a B2C uh, uh, product, consumer facing, Telegram is a good place to go. A line is really popular in China. I'm sorry, they're really popular in Japan. Uh, they have over 200 million users. Uh, if you're looking to do a B2C, a consumer-facing product for Southeast Asia and Japan, I would go flying. Uh, then there's Viber. Uh, Viber just introduced, um, they just introduced bots uh, earlier this year. So very new to the space, but they're a pretty popular messaging platform in Europe. Uh, and then of course there's Siri, they're incorporating this sort of thing in, in Amazon Echo. Um, so next let's look at um, some of the UI elements and what it means. So, one of the main challenges, and, and we can go back to the slide and look at it, one of the main challenges is that is building for all these different platforms, is that they're all going to have different UI elements. So let's look at Facebook's. So Facebook has uh, a number of different elements, uh, for example, like greeting cards, they have quick reply messages, they have structured uh, messages, uh, then they also have carousels. So really quickly, I'm going to show you some, some bots. So, see, I just got a, a, a message from this bot. So it says, just blah, 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 blah. it's asking me like how my day went, you know, I could rate it. And believe it or not, it's gonna take all this information and it's gonna remember it and it's gonna, uh, it's going to try to help, you know, get context out of it. So now it's going to respond. You just, getting an idea of how this works. Cool. Uh, now let's look at the chatbots live bot. So this is a, a bot for our publication. Um, and basically when we write articles, people can follow these articles or they can follow specific category, specific topic. So this is a carousel. Oh, didn't mean to do that. This is a carousel, okay? 
And um, this is a persistent menu. It gives you all the things that you know you can do. One of the cool things about bots is that we can do a live chat room. So we have this kind of additional uh, cap uh, capability. And so let's say we want to talk to let's say hi. How are you? And let's say we wanted to get articles on user experience. Boom, it gives us articles uh, uh, about user experience. So how about maybe we want to follow articles about artificial intelligence. I'll just type AI. And you, you don't have to type this verbatim, but you can type other things like, I'm going to see articles about AI. And uh, it'll come back and boom. And then it lets you subscribe to these different topics. So one of the things that we're doing is we're segmenting the audience. So a certain part of the people that come to Chatbots Life are going to want to see AI stuff. See, they can subscribe right here. Uh, other people are going to want to see design stuff. So in the future, when we send out uh, the latest articles, we're going to send the design stuff to the design people and the AI stuff to the AI people. So this kind of gives you a pretty good idea of, of the Facebook uh, elements, the UI elements. And again, this is a challenge because um, for the other platforms, for the other front ends, they're going to have different front end UIs, which means you might have to redesign a, a lot of your bot. So it could be on two or three different front ends. So next, um, where should you build first? Okay, and this is what uh, where a lot of uh, bot developers are building for first right now. Facebook Messenger is by far the most popular. Uh, and that's where I would recommend starting. Um, I also like Kick um, if you're looking to test an idea just because you can get more people to it. Um, another really good one is Slack, um, Telegram, Skype, so you kind of get the idea. But I would definitely start with Facebook Messenger because it's, it's the easiest. You have a lot of these UI elements and you can get quick feedback. So next is the NLP layer, right? This is the part that um, takes uh, natural languages and turns it into inputs and outputs. So um, what is NLP? Uh, NLP is an umbrella that encompasses several different disciplines that tackle the interaction between computer system and human natural language. Um, so that includes sub-disciplines such as NLU, which is natural language understanding. Now there is a couple of, uh, these are the, the biggest uh, platforms out there, and I'll tell you a little bit about each. Um, Watson Conversation Service, that's the logo on the bottom right, um, basically that allows um, you to process language um, with AI and API.ai. AI are also two really big ones. API.ai is owned by Google, it was re recently acquired by them. Uh, and with AI is, uh, was acquired in 2015 by Facebook. So uh, both of these work by uh, having things called intents and entities and, and basically parses language into into uh, verbs and nouns to, to oversimplify it. I'm oversimplifying it. Uh, verbs and nouns, so I could understand what a person's trying to do. Uh, other really popular ones is Lewis, uh, which is uh, Microsoft's language understanding intelligence service, and that connects with the uh, Microsoft Bot Framework, which is a really really good tool for making bots. Uh, you also have the Google Cloud Platform, the Google Cloud Platform, <laughs> that now um, you know Google allows natural language, NL API. You, could, you guys could check out. So part three, the making of a bot. So building bots is easy. Building good bots is really, really hard. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, the reason is, is that um, it's a completely new paradigm shift. The good news is, though, is that technology is being democratized. Uh, Non-techies will be able to jump in and build good bots. Uh, and we're already seeing that. One of the most popular bots um, was built by Hollywood screenwriters. So um, the other cool thing about bots is that it's, it's really putting emphasis on the uh, rapid prototyping uh, MVP approach to building products. So you can build a good MVP probably over the weekend uh, for a bot, test your idea, uh, do a lot of things manually on the back end, and just see if you're, if you're hitting a nerve, uh, if you're going to have product market fit. So the cool thing is that, is that technology is being democratized. So a little bit more about why it's so hard. So if you think about uh, chatbots and you look at this image, like what do you think chatbots really are, right? If you look at any technology that, that does really, really well, 
what they do really, the reason why they do so well is because they're a natural expression of something that we already do. So what do chatbots express that we already do? And um, one of the things that I think is that chatbots are natural exp expression and an externalization of the thing that we do most often, that we do every single moment of every single day, and that is we think. We're always thinking. In other words, we're always talking to ourselves, right? We, we, the average person has like between 50 and 70,000 thoughts per day, and the human OS, the human operating system is thinking. It's thinking in language, it's thinking uh, thoughts, it's talking to yourself. And for the first time, the machine operating system of language and the human operating system of language are going to overlap. So I think that's going to be really interesting. We have to start thinking of bots more um, as an overlap between human OS and, 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 and OS uh, for bots. So what are some of the common mistakes? And we see this over and over and over again. And, the, and it's kind of funny, but uh, bots are not websites and they're not apps. So most developers, they try to cram websites and apps into bots and they fail. Uh, bots have a very limited GUI, a graphical user interface, uh, and the focus is on conversations. So remember, all those other apps failed, but messaging apps survived, um, in part because they're conversational, because they're so media and information is going back and forth. So your bot really has to leverage conversations. And then it'll be more, it'll be very, very uh, um, engaging. So when you build a bot, uh, these are the three, four things that, that I really um, recommend looking at. So the first thing is, um, since we're in the very beginning of this, uh, I recommend looking at chatbot first use cases. So these are use cases where you can really leverage the, the power of the platform. And, and if you look at all the big winners from like the mobile space, from, from apps, you'll see they did this really, really well. For example, uh, Uber was not possible with the desktop. You needed to have a phone. And Uber and Lyft, they both really, really took advantage of this new medium and, and everything that it came with it. So uh, chatbots, uh, there's going to be a chatbot in the near future, that's it's going to be a billion-dollar company, and they're going to they're going to get to that point because they're leveraging the power of conversations. They're leveraging the uniqueness of the platform. So, uh, when you're thinking about chatbot first use cases, ask uh, things like when is when is it when is conversation the best way to get things done uh, versus searching or using an app. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, when do apps and websites fail. Um, when do you call businesses instead? Uh, for example, law is a great example, like asking a legal question. You, you could ask, um, you can ask uh, Siri or you can ask Google or you can Google it, but you're not really going to get the answer because your situation is going to be different than whoever wrote about that story. Um, another area that I think chatbots are really going to excel in is uh, task-oriented use cases, like you want to order a pizza or you want to uh, get a certain task done, like fight a parking ticket, uh, or find out if your flight's delayed. You're never going to download an app to do that, right? Uh, but you will use an app. You will use a bot. Uh, the next thing that you really have to uh, consider is bot design and copywriting. So you should consider um, white space, GIFs, pics, uh, how, uh, using the success formula, which is uh, when you write, your writing should be very simple, very unexpected, surprising, concrete, credible has to be emotional, and a really good bot tells a really good story, which is why copywriters have uh, done really well with bots. Uh, and then you also have to think about persuasiveness, because there's certain things a bot can do uh, that, that could be very, very persuasive. And then is bot superpowers. Now, these are things that bots could do that apps would have a really, really hard time doing or could, can't do at all. Uh, one example of this would be super personalization. So bots right now, can ask in a very natural uh, way. They can ask uh, users questions about themselves, and users answer it because it's it's part of the medium, right? Uh, what this allows us to do is two things. One is we can get better data on our users, and then we can track their behavior. Uh, we could see what buttons they're clicking on. We could see what actions they're performing within the bot, and so we could super personalize it. So this is the first time that companies are having this ability uh, of scalable super personalization. Um, I gave the example earlier of walking into uh, your favorite, into the mall and automatically looking at your favorite shirt. Well, bots are going to be more and more like that. And, and they'll also be able to predict your behavior. You, they'll see that you like to buy the large polos when it goes on sale in August. And so they'll preempt you. 
the Siri bot will know that you like to buy pizza every Sunday at, at noon. So at 12.45, I might preempt you and say, hey, would you like me to put that order in? Uh, and so on. Um, and then there's social powers. Uh, for example, talking to groups. Uh, this is not a feature that's live yet, but it's coming soon. Uh, in the future, let's say you and your friends wanted to go to a vacation, um, and you're messaging each other inside a messenger, is in the group, uh, you're going to be able to summon a bot, and the bot will be able to, to handle all the details of the trip. They'll be able to make sure that everyone gets the plane ticket, that the plane tickets are next to each other, um, that you know, you're know you staying at the same hotel, uh, that you're arriving in, at the same time, uh, and then when you when you get to your vacation spot, uh, it might suggest places to go and things to see, um, and then it might keep an eye on you, like maybe one of you someone gets lost uh, and it helps you. So um, these are some of the bot superpowers. And then the last piece, which is really, really important, that's habit-forming design. Um, you, Since this is a new paradigm, it's a really huge opportunity to form new habits. Uh, this is when new habits happen. And um, when you're creating your, your, your bot, you have to consider things like what the triggers are, both external and internal, what the pain points are, and what action, actions the person needs to take um, to get the rewards, and how we can we give them rewards that are really, really uh, exciting and give them a dopamine rush. And then how can we get users to invest in our bot? Because the more they invest, uh, the better the product we get for them. The more we'll learn about them and the more value we can give them in the future. So this sums up um, overall what we talked about, and I'll open it up for questions. And once again, thank you for, for being a part of this. Thank you very much, Stefan. This is Paul. Um, great presentation. I have a question, um, sure. and maybe it's my ignorance, but it seems to me that um, the word chatbot sort of seems to indicate that there's some text involved. But isn't in fact, I mean, I have a, a Samsung G3 watch, which I can talk to, um, uh -huh. and uh, obviously there's Alexa and there's Home and there's other things like that. Is there any implication that you know a chatbot is text-driven um, or uh, speech is on a par. Well, where do you see those two things marrying or not? The, uh, uh, this is one of the best questions because uh, <laughs> this is a, one of the problems that Facebook is facing right now is that they use this word chatbot to describe this, uh, this experience on, on Messenger. And I'm pretty sure if they could walk it back, they would. And um, I know this because uh, I spoke with the PM for um, for Facebook Messenger, uh, Mikhail Lorianov, and, and he's like, you know, uh, people get hung up on chatbots and they think that these uh, these things should just be text uh, text heavy, or but that's not the case. Uh, we might uh, offer a way for you to talk to the bot because texting is a pain, right? Um, and in the future, uh, right now, a lot of the things that Facebook is working on, be because the AI and the NLP is not 100 percent there, the ex the accuracy is not 100 percent is they're, they're making it more and more GUI rich. So in, for Facebook Messenger bots in the foreseeable future, I think you're going to see um, this, this concentration more on bots being more like instant apps that you can talk to versus you know, virtual assistants that can do things to, for you only through texting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I know. I just uh, will supplement that by saying a uh, few, about a month or so ago, we ran a training on Voice XML for a huge financial institution. We're running that program for their India team. Mm -hmm. We ran it in the United States. We're running it for their India team next week uh, in um, in Delhi. And I'm we're finding that the uptake of voice applications is general, you know, rep, uh, just just general application and general theory is, is much higher. And I do, is, you know, again, I'm not, into this as deeply nearly as you are, but it seems to me that voice is going to be one of the powerful applications that drive these bots in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of these, the, the bigger companies, and this is, I think, the first time we've seen it, where you have uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM, um, they're all jumping in on, on the on this, uh, in this space, Apple, um, and they're both jumping in it on both the voice side and on the, on the messaging side. Great. 
Yeah, there's a lot of potential, and there's obviously a lot of potential for vertical applications. Um, I don't, I don't also just like to, I'm waiting to ask for other questions. There's a, recently, I believe at the end of last year, Google announced that it was going to be providing their APIs or access to its data, because one of the things that Google does have more than probably any other organization in the world is data. And in order to have, whether it's a bot or other technology, examine the data for healthcare applications, for energy applications, for all sorts of other uses, I'm sure that one of the bigger challenges is both turning that text, word, phrase, you know, whatever it is that gets communicated to the bot into intelligence. And obviously the better the intelligence of the, of the Watson or the, whatever the application is, the little more likely you are to get very good um, um, information back. Right. And, and one of the other things that I'm seeing is, um, and it's it's a it's a company that I that I know pretty well. Um, they're called Radbots. They introduced this idea of personas. So, <clears throat> let's say that you're uh, you're a, a user and you're using five or ten different bots. Right. When you when you use these different pieces of technology, uh, personas will allow developers to keep track of all your behavior across different bots. So we have like a behavioral profile for the user, and so we can predict things within our own bot. The person's behavior uh, online and using other bots. So I think this is on, on, on Google and all the information they have on users, and also on Facebook and all the information they have on users. Well, this has been very informative, and we will continue in the discussion. Looking forward to everyone's feedback. Please do give us that on your, um, as I said, go to the chat on the window here. Um, click on the link, give us some feedback, get a free course as a result for life, but also I want to thank uh, Stefan for a fantastic webinar and uh, to be continued with more in the future. Awesome. Thank Everyone you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, great rest of your day. Yeah.